Good morning, happy Sabbath. Good. Oh, isn't it amazing to be in the house of, house of the Lord? Amen. So, there comes a point in everybody's life. And my buddies at CACS, I, I don't think you're there yet, but I, I'm arriving to this point in my life where everywhere I look, one of my friends are either getting engaged or married. Have you been there? Have you ever been there? Well, I'm going through there right now, and, it, and I've realized that it creates a dilemma. And you might be there, so you might understand this dilemma. But the dilemma is that, I know it sounds horrible, but the dilemma is I don't know which wedding to go to. Because you see, if you go to my parents' house, and you go to uh, their refrigerator, you'll see that their refrigerator is plastered with wedding invitations. And I know this sounds horrible, but to, just to give it into retrospect, I have friends getting married in Michigan, friends getting married in Washington State, and friends getting married in California. And if I was to go to all these different weddings, one, I'd be broke. <laughs> Two, you'd be wondering if you even had an associate pastor anymore. But regardless of this dilemma, I know that there is one wedding that I do not want to miss. And that's when our groom, Jesus Christ, comes down from the clouds and takes us home. But as we're going to learn today, there are two brides. And there are two wedding processions. And we have a choice today for which one we want to follow. But before we dig in God's word, let's open up with another word of prayer. Heavenly Father, my God, Lord, right now, this moment, it's yours. Lord, I pray that you speak to us through your word, that you open our hearts and our ears. And Lord, I just ask that you forgive me, for I'm imperfect, but you are perfect, Lord. So use me as you can. And may all the glory and honor and praise be unto you forever and ever Amen. Amen. All right. I'd like to invite you to open up with me to Revelation chapter 17. <clears throat> and when you get to Revelation chapter 17, and we're starting verse 1, give me a hearty amen. 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 So in Revelation chapter 17, verse 1, God's word says, One of the seven angels who had seven bowls came to me and said, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her the kings of the earth commit adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away into the spirit, into a desert, and there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with the blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. So here we have a woman, and it says that she is seated or sitting on water. Do you remember what does water symbolize in the Bible? Well, exactly, it represents people, but don't just take my word for it. Let's take God's word for it. So if you look over to Revelation 17, verse 15. So Revelation 17, verse 15, it says, Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are people, multitudes, nations, and languages. So here we see that she is sitting on people, nations, languages, and multitudes. <clears throat> but then as we continue to verse 3, we begin to get a closer look at this prostitute, at this harlot. And it says in verse, verse 3, Then the angel carried me away in, in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names, and had seven heads and ten horns. So before we continue any further, we have to understand what in the Bible, what do women symbolize? What does a woman symbolize? A church. 
But again, I don't want you to take my word for it. But let's go back into our Bibles and see this for ourselves. So I would like to invite you to turn with me to Isaiah 54. Turn with me to Isaiah 54, verse 5. Isaiah 54, verse 5. And when you get there, give me a hearty amen. 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 All right. In Isaiah 54, verse 5, it says, For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. So here we see that God is the husband of his people. But let's take this a step forward and let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, it says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promise you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. So here we see that our husband is Christ, and we are to be presented to him as pure and blameless. But let's continue and turn a few Uh, a few books with me to the right to Ephesians chapter 5 and in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22 to 27 Ephesians 5 verse 22 to 27 and I'm pretty sure every single one of you have read this before but in Ephesians 5 verses 22 to 27 it says wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so, others, so also wives submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So here we see that God's desire is for his church to be holy and blameless, and that God's church is his bride. Now before I go any further, this, further I've, I've heard people use this verse before, and I don't know if you've had either, but I have one with some buddies, and they, they have their wives and their fiancés and their girlfriends, and when they read this verse, They say, they read the first part where it says, wives submit to your husband. And it's funny because a lot of them, they say, you know, they're like, you know, it's biblical. You got to submit to me. And they're like, so since you have to submit to me, you got to, you got to make me a sandwich. (laughs) And I always laugh at them, but I'm like, hey man, it's biblical. You're supposed to love your wife like Christ loved the church. And do you remember how much he loved us? He died on the cross for you and me. And even more, when Christ came, he said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. But I'm just going to leave that right there. And continue with me to Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. So in Revelation 12, verse 1, we get the final image of this woman, of this church. And in Revelation chapter, 1, or chapter, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, give me a hearty amen when you get there. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. Here we see the final image of the true church, of God's church. But then flip back with me five five chapters real fast to Revelation 17. And don't, don't the description of these two women differ entirely? Because here we had a pure, white, blameless virgin, virgin. And then here we have a harlot. But how did this happen? Well, let's take a, let's take a closer look. And look with me once again. I'm going to read verses 3 and 4. It says, Then the angel carried me away into spirit into the desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, 
that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. So here we have a total different picture of this woman. She's no longer blameless and innocent, but she is a harlot. And how, did, how did she get there? Well, first, let's take a closer look and see. In verse 3, what does it say she's sitting on? On a beast, which had seven heads and ten horns. When, when have we read about this? Do you guys remember? Well, go back a few, few chapters with me. And let's go to Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. <clears throat> and we'll see this beast again, or what my buddy and I like to call them, beasties, just because they're a little more family friendly. So we'll see in Revelation 13, verse 1, it says, And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on his horns, and each head had a blasphemous name. So here we see that the beast that she's sitting on is the same beastie that we find in Revelation 13. And I'm not going to go much detail on that before, right now, just for the sake of time. But if you are interested in learning more about this beast, I'd invite you to go to our website and listen to the last three sermons that Pastor Harley had. Because he'll go into great detail who this beast is. But as we continue, I want us to look at verse, verse 5. It says, The title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, and the abomination of the earth. Now what's interesting here is that back in the time when this was written, prostitutes would have a headband on their head. And on their headband, they would write their name. So here we see that this harlot that we see in Revelation 17, her name is Mystery, Babylon, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, and the abomination of the earth. Now as you read these names, it's kind of odd. Why, why would her name be Babylon the Great? Wasn't that a nation? And even more, if you read in verse 18, it says, the woman you saw is a great city that rules over the kings of the earth. So as you first read this, it could seem kind of confusing, kind of odd. But you know, I praise the Lord because he has given us every tool that we need to understand the Bible. And one of those tools <clears throat> is the spirit of prophecy. So I'd like to invite you to take out your bulletins and flip over to the back and we're going to read the meditation together. <clears throat> so flip out your bulletins because we see through God through his, through his instrument LNG White makes it very clear who this woman, who this Babylon is. So if you have your bulletins out with me, it reads, in Revelation 14, the first angel is followed by a second proclaiming, Babylon is fallen, is fallen the great city because she has made all the nations drink of the wine of her wrath. In fornication, Revelation 14, verse 8. The term Babylon is derived from Babel that signifies confusion. It is employed in scriptures to designate the various forms of false or apostate religions. In Revelation 17, Babylon is, re is represented as a woman, a figure which is used in the Bible as a symbol of a church. A virtuous woman represents a pure church. A vile woman an apostate church. So here we see that this woman that we find in Revelation 17 is the same false religious system that the devil has been using since day one. But don't just take my word, don't just take on the right word, but take God's word for it. And you see, <clears throat> as I was preparing for this message and I started looking <clears throat> at these texts that we're about to look at, it reminded me of what some people once said to me. I had an individual come up to me and he says, wow, you want to be a pastor? And I was like, yeah. 
He's like, how can you be a pastor? How can you have your whole profession on talking about a book that is just a bunch of stories? <clears throat> and all I have to say is if you believe this book is nothing more but just a bunch of stories, it's because you haven't read it. Because when you realize that the Bible was written by 44 authors and over a span of a 1,500 years, and yet it's all cohesive and it all connects, it leaves me speechless. And right now, I want to show you the connections in the Bible between the, Babel, the false system of Babylon in the Old Testament and this new system we are learning about right now. So I hope you guys can read. The first one is in Jeremiah 51, verse 13. Thank you for dimming the lights. It says, you who dwell by many waters. In Revelation 17, what we just read, it says, seated upon many waters. And then if we go to Jeremiah 51, verse 7, it says, a golden cup in the Lord's hand. What does it say in Revelation 17, 4? holds a golden cup. <clears throat> but it continues. Look, in, in Jeremiah 51, verse 8, Babylon has fallen. And here in Re Revelation 14, verse 8, we see that fallen, fallen is Babylon. But it continues. There are still more connections. Here in the Old Testament, Isaiah 47, verses 7 and 8, we see, I shall not sit as a widow. In Revelation 18, verse 7, it says, a queen I sit, I am no widow. But then here we continue, we see in Jeremiah 51, verse 45. My people go out of the midst of her. And in Revelation 18, verse 4, come out of her, my people. It's been the same message since day one. But there's more. We go to Jeremiah 51, verse 48, and it says, Then heaven and earth and all that is in them will shout for joy over Babylon. And in Revelation 18, verse 20, it says, At her fall, heaven, the saints, and the apostles re will rejoice over her. And finally, our last one for this morning, it says, In Jeremiah 51, 64, As a stone shall Babylon sink and rise no more. And in Revelation 18, verse 21, it says, Like a great millstone thrown into the sea, so shall Babylon be, thr <clears throat> be thrown down. Here we see that this false religious system, this Babylon of the Old Testament, is the exact same false system that we find today. So if it's the exact same system, wouldn't it help for us to figure out what the characteristics are? so that we can be ready, so that when we see it coming, we'll know and be able to discern that this is the false religious system. So I'd like to show you some of the characteristics of the Old Testament Babylon and show how they're so relevant to the Babylon we, are, we have today. <clears throat> so the, for the first characteristic, we're going to go to Daniel chapter 4, verse 30. So turn with me to Daniel Chapter 4, verse 30. And give me a hearty amen when you get there. And in Daniel, chapter 4, verse 30, from the mouth of the king of Babylon himself, Nebuchadnezzar, God's word says, <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar says, he said, is not this the great Babylon I built as a royal residence by my mighty power and for my glory of my majesty? And we see here that this is the same king that the, just one chapter prior had made a statue for the people to worship him. And as we see here, the first characteristic of this, of this Babylon, of this false system, is that they put man's way before God's. So if you see a religious system 
That is putting man's tradition above God's word. All I'd have to say is, run for the hills. But see, there's a second characteristic <clears throat> that, we find in the, that we find in the Old Testament Babylon, and this is idol worship. <clears throat> one, one scholar, Dr. Alexander Hislop, once said, Babylon is the prime source through which idolatry flowed. And even more, if you turn with me to Ezekiel 6, verse 4. Ezekiel 6, verse 4. We see here that during the captivity of the Israelites, under the, under the ruling of Babylon, that they were influenced by the Babylonian religious structure. Because if you look with me, in Ezekiel chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Your altars will be de de demolished. Your incense and altars will be smashed. And I will slay your people in front of your idols. And, as, and if you continue re reading Ezekiel, you see, that, you see that the people of Israel had lost focus of who their God was. And that they were worshiping worthless, wor worse, worthless stone and gold images. And I know when I'm preaching this morning, you're saying, oh, this is great. You know, we see this characteristic and we know, we, we see that, you know, this, this other religion it, oh, in, their, in their religious structure, they'll have idol worship. But what does that mean for me? I mean, I'm here. I'm, I'm not worshiping idols. There's nothing in my house. You know, I don't have a big statue in my, lo in my yard. But I have a question for you. These two characteristics that I've gone over so far, are we endangered of following them? First one, man's way or God's way? Look at your life. Who are you living by? Are you living by your will or God's will? Characteristic number two, do you have idols in your life? Are there things that are keeping you away from God? Are there things that are taking your attention away from God? Could it be TV? Could it be video games? Could it be a hobby? Could there be something that you are in your life that you're making an idol? Well, there were for the Israelites. And there could be for us. Well, we'll continue on to our third characteristic. And our third characteristic is the teaching of the Im immortality of the soul. So turn with me just one or two chapters to Ezekiel ch chapter 8, verse 14. And in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14, <clears throat> God's word says, Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord. And I saw women sitting there mourning for Tammuz. Do you guys know who Tammuz is? Well, I didn't know who Tammuz was either. So I did some research. And I found out that Tammuz is the Babylonian deity for vegetation. Not vegetarian, which he might be vegetarian, but for vegetation. And it was believed that <clears throat> Tammuz would die whenever there was no rain and it was hot. And so for that reason, that's why you find these Israelites mourning over Tammuz because it must have been hot and hadn't been raining. So in their minds, they figured that their deity had died. And clearly, this deity did not live in Texas. But then they believed that when it started to cool down and then when rain came back, that Tammuz would be resurrected and be alive again. So here we see that, that they had a glimpse of the belief of immortality of the soul. But even more, if you go to the very heart of the Babylonian religion, you see that their belief was that your soul was immortal and that when you died, your spirit went to the spirit world. And what's interesting here is that the Israelites begin to believe it. And as I, I was reading this, I started to wonder, had they forgotten what two of their greatest kings had written? both Solomon and David? Well, turn with me to, to Ecclesiastes <clears throat> chapter 9, verse 5. 
In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5, King Solomon writes, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even the memory of them is forgotten. So I have a question for you. If when, we, if when they died, they went to a spiritual, spirit world, wouldn't there be a reward for them? Wouldn't they remember something? But here we see that King Solomon begs to differ. He did not believe what Babylon was teaching. But even more, if we go back to Psalms 115, to the writings of David, and in Psalms chapter 115, <clears throat> verse 17, And that's Psalms 115, <clears throat> verse 17. David writes, It is not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down to silence. It is we who extol the Lord, both now and forevermore. And you see, if we were to have immortal souls, when we die, if we were to go to heaven, wouldn't we be praising God? I mean, I don't know about you, but if, if I went to heaven... The first thing I would do would be find Jesus and to praise him. But if David's saying that the dead don't praise, the, don't praise God, that must mean that when you die, it's nothing more than a sleep. And that the next thing you see is Jesus. So we see here so far three characteristics of this false religious system where they will teach of immort immortality of the soul. And finally, one of our last ones is found in Ezekiel 8, verse 15 and 16. Ezekiel 8, verses 15 and 16. We just read the verse prior. <clears throat> and in Ezekiel 8, verses 15 and 16, God's word says, He said to me, Do, not, do you see this, son of man? You will see things that are even more detestable than this. He then brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord, and there at the entrance to the temple, between the portico and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east. They were bowing down to the sun and the east. So where were these 25 men? Where were they? They were in the temple, in God's house. But were they worshiping God? No. Oh. They had their back to the altar. And who were they worshiping? Son. And I'll get back to this characteristic, but I have a question for you, for me. How many times in our life have we gone into God's house with our back turned away from him. And I want to take a moment, I just want to praise the Lord, because you see, our God doesn't call the equipped, but he equipped those he calls. Because I remember in my BC years, before conversion or before Christ, I would go to church. You see, I was born and raised Adventist, so I'd go to church. But I would go there for the wrong reason. Because you see, I'd go there just because my friends were there. I'd go there because my family made me. Or I'd go there just because that's what we did on Sabbath. And I would be present in the church, but I wouldn't be in the presence of the Lord. And all I want to say is, I praise the Lord that we have a God who seeks the lost. Amen. And who says, you know, you might have your back turned on me, but my back is never turned on you. Amen. So this morning... If your back is turned to God, I plead to you, turn around. Because God's waiting there with his arms open. But going back to this characteristic, in Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 15 and 16, we see that they were worshiping the sun. Do we still have sun worship today? Yes? So... <clears throat> You know, we might not have some worship like we're used to. But if you remember, there was one sign that God made for his people. And that sign is found in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12 
and we're going to read verses 19 and 20. So Ezekiel chapter 12, verses, and then we're going to read 19 and 20. And God gave him his people a sign. And it says, Also I gave them the Sabbath as a sign between us, so that they would know that I, the Lord, made them holy. And in verses 19 and 20 it says, I am the Lord your God. Follow my decrees and be careful to keep my law. Keep my Sabbath holy, that they may be a sign between us. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. So the Sabbath is God's sign, is God's gift to us, is God's day for us just to worship Him. So I have a question. If they worship on Sunday, who are they worshiping? And all I'm saying is, I'm not, I'm not totally saying they're, gonna, they're worshiping the sun god. But what I'm saying is, if they're not worshiping God, who else is there to worship? And finally, for the last characteristic, as we go back to Revelation 17, we see that the greatest change, the greatest <clears throat> characteristic of this system is the love for the world. Because here we had a blameless and pure woman who becomes a harlot who is dressed in purple and scarlet, ordained with glittering gold and <clears throat> glittering gold and precious stones. This religious system will have a love for the world. So our characteristics are one who puts God that puts man's traditions above God's law who worship idols, who believes in more immortality of the soul, who worships or who promotes Sunday worship, and finally, who loves the world. And my, and my request to you today is, if you see a system out there like this today, to run for the hills. <clears throat> because you see, there is a system out there like this. And what system is that? It's the Roman Catholic system. And notice I say system, but not people. Because you, <clears throat> you see that the devil is still using the same tricks that he did from old to mislead his people. And today we saw that there are two brides and that there, are two, <clears throat> that there are two brides and two women. And we have a choice. Which one will we be a part of? Because you see, for those who follow the harlot, there's a different destination than for those who follow the woman, the pure woman. Go with me to Revelation 18, verses 4 and 8. <clears throat> and in Revelation 18, verses 4 and 8, it says... Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given back. <clears throat> Give back to her as she has given. Pay back her double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as a queen, I am not a widow, and I will never mourn. <clears throat> Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her. Deaf, mourning, and famine, she will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord who judges her. So here we see that those who follow the world, who follow this woman, that their destination will be the great lake of fire. But for those who love Jesus, who put Jesus first in their life and follow his commandments, their destination is totally different. Turn with me to Revelation 19, verses 6 and 9. And Holly read it for us already. You see, if we stay true to God, this is our destination. And in Revelation 19, verses 6 to 9, it says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like a roar of a rushing waters, like a loud peal 
of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen and bright, bright and clean were given to her to wear. Fine linen rep stands for the righteous acts of the saints. Then the angel said to me, Write, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Amen. And I don't know about you, but that's one wedding supper I do not want to miss. And this morning, today, we have a choice. Who are we going to follow? My question for you today is, who are you following? Because you see, the one, the person, or the system that you're following now will be the system that you will follow in the end. So today is a day to choose who you will follow. So if there are things in your life that are keeping you from God, maybe television, maybe Netflix, video games, a job, a relationship, a friend, whatever it is, I invite you to let it go and to give your life to Jesus and to follow him no matter where you go. Because Jesus Christ is coming soon, amen? amen. And before he comes, we're going to have to make a choice and we're going to have to make a stand. <clears throat> and my thing is, if you cannot choose Jesus today, how will you choose Jesus when there's a gun pointed at your forehead? Because you see, you might say, well, Austin, we live in America. That'll never happen. Well, I want to share, share something with you. Last Sunday, my roommate and I, we were, we were at the apartment, and we were watching 60 Seconds. And I don't know if any of you have ever watched it. <clears throat> but Sunday, they were doing a special on ISIS, or the independent state of Islam. And they were talking about this town in the Middle East. And I know if I was to pronounce it, I would slaughter it, so I'm not even going to try. But there was this town in the Middle East that was known for having Christians living in it since the first century after Jesus Christ. And this town was invaded by this organization. And those who did not flee, either by choice or didn't have time, they had a choice. <clears throat> These members of ISIS, they'd come into the house with their guns loaded, and they'd point them at the man of the house, and they said, you have a choice. Either your family dies, or you give up being a Christian, and you pay a tax. And as we were watching it, they were interviewing person after person who had given up their faith. They said, you know, my family was on the line, and they paid the tax. So to close this evening, I want to leave you with one situation. Here we are. I'm about to close. I'm doing the appeal, in fact. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, through those doors, bust armed men, terrorists, ISIS, whoever you want them to be, they bust through those doors with guns loaded, and they point it at you. I know you've heard this before, but I want you to imagine your head. The gun is pointed at you, and they give you a choice. They said, you can give up your faith or you can die. What would you say right now? But then what happens when they have the gun and they move it from you to your loved ones, to your husband, to your children, to your friends, to your family, and they say, give up your faith or they die. What would you say? Bigger question, what would they say? Have you been an example of Christ to them? Have you shown them Jesus' love? You see, it is my prayer today that as the gun is pointed at us, that our only answer will be, you know, it's okay, because I choose Jesus. So this morning, if you want to choose Jesus, I'd invite you to stand 
As we sing our closing hymn, give me Jesus.